This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. You have probably heard a lot lately about the limitations of solar power as a green renewable energy source, but with some new supporting technologies on the way and others already in the field, the future of solar power looks as bright as the sun. So in the last couple of years we looked at the future of fusion power, of fission, of thorium, and of power satellites, and I thought it was time to take a look at the future of solar power. So we will be looking at solar photovoltaic, solar thermal, space-based solar, and some more variations and trying to see how the landscape will unfold. Now whenever I do an episode on the future of a given power supply, I feel obliged to say up front that my own philosophy on which sort of energy we should research is yes. Barring something like a micro-sized and instantly throttleable matter-to-energy converter or similar, none of the power concepts really on the table these days hold such an advantage over the others that we should ignore them or opt for a single energy option, which doesn't really seem a good idea even if one of the energy sources is significantly cheaper than the others. Diversity has its value, and just because you can grow corn for half the price you could grow wheat or sugar or rice does not make it a good idea to get 90% of your calories, or fuel, from that one crop. We probably want to err on the side of caution and assume the same is true for power generation, but if you were going to pick one current technology to go all in on, solar isn't a bad one, since it's fairly plentiful everywhere. Sunmetrics ran the numbers once for the worst place for solar, a cloudy archipelago north of Russia, and it still has roughly a quarter of the sunlight as the best place for solar over the course of a year, and it's not really subject to the same supply chain issues we have for other fuels, mostly, we'll get to some of those problems in a bit. This is a big part of why folks like solar, a sturdy and cheap panel offers long term energy independence if slapped on a roof or in a backyard and combined with a good battery system, gets around the issues of weather and nighttime. Now the materials to build those panels have supply chain issues, same for either batteries or another backup, but not for the fuel itself which is renewable as long as the sun exists. We have to put that caveat in because this is SFIA, where we do regularly contemplate how to handle stuff like refueling our sun or civilizations lasting long after even the star was born out. But certainly our sun offers a more reliable and long-term power supply than fossil fuels. The point is a bit more debatable for fusion as nuclear has some definite pros, including a very long-term supply of fuel, as we looked at in the future of fission. Of course so would chemical biofuels or renewable fuels, and another way you can use solar is to grow crops and biofuels with it. For that matter, it is a fairly chemically simple process to suck carbon dioxide and water out of the air and turn it into hydrocarbons like gasoline, making them a carbon neutral fuel, but it takes a lot more power to do this than you get from burning that fuel, so its value is in portability and storage. As a result there are pathways forward if solar panels get cheaper, but batteries mostly do not where we might use the sun to power gasoline production to take advantage of the high energy density and portability of hydrocarbons or even hydrogen by itself, if we get better at hydrogen storage, which we all. We could probably do a whole episode just on hydrogen storage improvements and their uses as a fuel or propellant or in tandem with solar or nuclear energy, and nonetheless it is a topic for another time. Key notion as we go into these concepts, we will explain how classic solar energy systems work but we aren't even vaguely interested in trying to break down the exact economics of a solar economy compared to wind or oil or uranium, because that is simply unpredictable 20 years from now. It's nothing ever so simple as finding out what the price point is for solar panels as roofing tiles is so that everyone installs them, because we could get that price point tomorrow if someone invented a cheap mega battery, or never if someone invented a trusty Mr. Fusion for every home. In the same notion, tomorrow some could come out with a clanking self-replicator that could mass-produce things like solar panels, but governments might ban it being used Earthside so that we end up with microwave beaming from orbital solar power satellites built by robots on the moon. There is simply too much variability to technology and economics in a generation to speak with confidence, and for that matter we can't really do that with modern tech either, 
though we should never let that uncertainty cripple us into inaction and not picking policies. But we need to be cautious in picking those and sourcing our data. Folks tend to compare the rosiest numbers for their preferred energy source to the worst numbers from other power plants, and usually from crumbling old models rather than the brand new ones, like comparing a brand new wind turbine to the mileage of some 1970s Cadillac getting 8 miles per gallon when it was brand new, and using its mileage on some worn down engine still kicking around. This is the same thing we see with a lot of nuclear power too or spaceships and airplane designs, folks often don't just pick on all the technology they don't like but even do circular firing squads on the version of the preferred technology they do not favor. We'll skip examples as I'd imagine you can all think of plenty, and most of us all guilty of doing it ourselves at times too. But most importantly, the tech just tends to render all the neck and neck competition of today irrelevant tomorrow. As an example, one way around weather is to just float your solar panel up on a hydrogen or helium balloon to above the cloud layer, and the higher altitude also gives you longer daylight periods. However, this isn't economical because hydrogen and helium are really tiny compared to other elements and tend to leak through them, meaning you would have to reel your blimp down regularly to refuel it with expensive helium. But advances in various 2D materials like graphene show promise of ending that, in which case it suddenly gets very viable to basically permanently float objects, be it solar panels or wind turbines or delivery blimp drones using solar to drive pumps and turbines to move around. Indeed, you can potentially float houses and cities that way, see our Cloud Cities episode for more details. Graphene is also an amazing conductor and super strong, making it perfect for a discrete power cord and tether holding that floating panel to the ground and the houses or cities it's powering. In this very same way though, those same 2D materials with amazing conductive properties are the ones that seem to promise us the super batteries we really want. New materials being used in cathodes and anodes like graphene or ruthenium appear to hold the promise of making our current lithium-ion batteries old, obsolete, and clunky, naturally that would screw with the economics of floating panels connected by graphene wire tethers. If it was simply cheaper and easier to build and maintain twice as many panels down on the ground and connected to cheap and long-lasting super batteries that get us around not just the weather and night, but those unusual long-term outages too. Very approximately, since this new tech's still in development, a battery incorporating graphene and the new cathode technology can hold about six times the energy a current lithium-ion one can, about a watt-hour per gram, which is 3600 joules per gram or a kilowatt hour per kilogram. That's actually very low compared to gasoline, which comes in a dozen times more dense, though the battery is storing electricity directly rather than us combusting fuel which we can convert into electricity at an efficiency loss and with additional heavy machinery. What's awesome about it though is that it would charge very quickly and store energy at a very low rate of loss compared to modern batteries. Though it is worth noting that while modern batteries can lose a percent of charge a day and be considered good, coal can keep its energy bound up for geological time spans. I think sometimes folks forget that it is not just cost and inertia that keep fossil fuels in use, they have a lot of edges over other options. As those other options narrow those edges, resistance to using them will probably decline. Another thing with graphene and other 2D materials is that they appear to make for good solar panels, which would circumvent some of the other supply issues we have with modern solar panels. Most panels are made mainly of silicon, a substance basically as abundant as the carbon we make graphene from, but frequently incorporate a lot of rare earths, which while not as rare as that name implies and folks tend to think, are hardly super abundant either. Current research suggests graphene-based panels would take hardly any or no rare earth materials at all, and might even defy the shockley quasar limit, meaning you can get far higher efficiencies from them than silicon semiconductor-based panels. Amusingly, you can actually generate power from raindrops with graphene panels, which is handy when it's raining. Also a good reminder that an ultra-strong and light conductive material has some fairly broad applications with rival technologies like giant wind turbines or deep sea generators. This is not an episode on graphene, see our episode The Impact of Graphene for that, but it is a good reminder how one technology can massively disrupt tons of others, much as computers and internal combustion engines both did. 
and there are many other technologies being developed for grid scale power storage, such as ion air batteries, where power density and weight are secondary to cost and scalability. And computers and engines are good analogies for cheap energy and solar because they share that trait of being force multipliers. The effect of cheaper and more reliable energy is way bigger than simply a lower electric bill. In this same way, a civilization where most homes have solar panels on the roofs and banks of batteries in the basement is different economically, and probably even culturally, from one with that home solar for daytime use but nuclear power on the wider community power grid for nights and weather. Both of those approaches have a lot going for them as would other hybrids, you get a secondary economy if you fully and smartly develop cottage power production like that too, where folks either opt to spend more to build and maintain solar panels at their house in excess of their regular needs, or build to those regular needs and get more off the grid for peak consumption. I use the term cottage industry because folks might supplement their income by overproduction or restraining their usage, in much the same way subsistence farmers do with their gardens, livestock, or craftsmanship. In the grand scheme, this wouldn't be a huge economic impact I suspect, but might have big cultural impacts since it would tend to influence family life. Families tight on cash have even more reasons to turn the lights off when not in the room, since they can sell that energy, and so on. One problem with solar for this though is that the peaks and valleys in use and production will tend to flow together. I can't really sell my excess power on a sunny day to my neighbors to run their air conditioning because it's sunny for them too, and because I presumably want to run my air conditioner too, of course I can probably leave the temperature a degree higher for less comfort and sell that excess energy for peak value. That's hardly a unique conundrum in supply and demand. It tends to be common for anything that's hard to store, like produce for instance, or bulky like water. Nonetheless it's always a fairly irritating one and one that better batteries or energy storage gets around, though also assisted by using other types of power in tandem with solar, like nuclear, and by easier transport like massive superconducting electric trunk lines running around the planet, and of course those introduce supply concerns too since folks can cut those lines. When contemplating the future though, we need to be pondering this stuff at least as much as the basic science, because it's how we notice that it's a very different future for folks with big roofs and lawns versus those in a multi-story apartment in a city, or for folks in sunny deserts versus cloudy northern climates. That is another example too, because solar has peak production both time of day and time of year, it's handy to either be able to store it or use it for something you don't need steadily. One example of that would be for folks living in sunny deserts to run a big pipeline out to the ocean and run pumps and desalinate during the day and summer, conveniently when your need for fresh water is highest anyway, because water is relatively easy to store and mass too, you just dig a hole and line it. These kinds of binge and purge, famine and feast sorts of production can often result in things being economically viable, like greening up the desert in those spots simply because you have a big surplus in production at your peaks and need something to do with it. This is also potentially handy for doing things like producing aluminum, an energy intense process, or even that trick I mentioned earlier for jamming carbon dioxide and water vapor back together to make hydrocarbons. It is probably worth noting though that the bits of your economy that are surviving because of such cheap surplus at peaks are often vulnerable to rapid obsolescence from a new bit of technology in this case better and cheaper energy storage, though all energy storage is likely to have a significant cost in money, space, and maintenance attached that it is likely to leave a decent niche market for relatively cheap peak energy, noontime solar and such. Batteries fell under $100 a kilowatt hour for the first time in 2021. But that still means a household needing 5 kilowatts to run their home would need $5,000 in battery storage in their basement just for a 10 hour night before considering all the extra costs surrounding getting those batteries installed in the first place. Batteries need replacing after anywhere from 5 to 13 years, and need a fair amount of space and maintenance during that time too. If you are spending $100 per month maintaining your battery capacity, you are probably not getting anything like the savings on your bill you were hoping for. I have been saying batteries a lot this episode, and partially because I tend to be bad about using it as a catch-all for energy storage so that I sometimes refer to even black holes as batteries, 
and improvements to batteries will help a lot, but I'm sure folks are expecting us to get around to molten salt and soil or thermal, and now is a good time to segue into that. There's a lot of ways to store energy, indeed that desalination of water trick is a more metaphorical one, akin to selling energy and putting the money in the bank, to buy energy later when you need it. But in terms of easy manipulation of energy, modern rechargeable batteries have a lot going for them, and maybe the biggest part of that is portability. Sunlight coming into Earth either reflects off things or gets absorbed by them, this warms them up and we can use that heat for power, just like in any thermal power plant, which is most of them. Indeed for outer space or a vacuum, we can actually have reflective windmills pushed by sunlight itself, but neither of those approaches is considered a form of classic solar power. We won't get too deep into the woods here, but when we say solar power, we usually mean photovoltaic power, which is where photons of light hit a substance and spit out an electron, resulting in voltage and current, hence photovoltaic. Volts are the measure of the electromotive force, named for Alessandro Volta, who invented the electrochemical battery cell, or voltaic pile, in 1799. This basic effect of electrons moving around as a result of absorbing photons, or emitting them, called the photoelectric effect, was proposed in 1905 and is what Albert Einstein actually got his Nobel Prize for, not relativity, and is the basic principle behind fluorescent and neon lighting. However, it wasn't until we discovered semiconductor materials about half a century later that photovoltaic power began being contemplated as a power source. This is not the birth of solar power in general of course, which predates humanity and drives every storm and fuels every plant and we have been using it for things like solar ovens, heating houses, or sun-dried bricks for making houses for a long time. So the terminology can get a bit confusing. When people are referencing solar power, they do mean photovoltaic power, and less often but still frequently, solar thermal. Solar thermal is taking advantage of sunlight to create heat and then run that through a heat engine, in the same way as we do for coal, gas, geothermal, or nuclear typically by running hot water through a steam engine or a turbine. Now there are several ways to turn heat into energy, maybe the most conceptually simple for solar thermal would be a steam engine whose boiler had clear sides and which had many parabolic mirrors or magnifying glasses angled towards it, heating the water into steam and turning that engine or driving its pistons. Indeed the very first attempts at solar thermal power did something along these lines and never really cut on due to their efficiency. The fluid that's popular to discuss for use in modern solar thermal power plants tends to be molten salt storage. This is where you have a big field with a ton of movable meals encircling a big tower, and those meals tilt with the time of day and season to reflect sunlight at the top of the tower in the center. Such meals are called heliostats, short for heliostationary or sun stationary. That receiver superheats molten salt, which we then pump through to run a steam power generator. Molten salt is handy because it's a hot liquid at temperatures water would be steam at, so it isn't under any pressure and isn't going to burst pipes. That's why there's so much talk about using it for other thermal power sources too, even on the moon or other airless worlds. Relatively weak pipes can keep it a liquid and just as importantly, some giant storage tank can be built that's well insulated but doesn't need to be super strong to avoid blowing under the internal pressure like a hot gas would. Since heat storage by quantity is about volume and heat loss from such objects is about surface area, using molten salt lets you make giant vats of solar heated molten salt that you can store for very long times. Under the cube square law, scaling objects up squares their surface area while cubing their volume, hence a storage tank 10 times bigger has 100 times the surface area leaking heat but 1000 times the total heat storage, or energy storage, so that it's effectively cooling at a tenth the speed the smaller tank would, in terms of energy loss. So the molten salt heated in the day can keep powering you at night, and if you build tanks big enough, you can keep the salt temperature fairly stable over many weeks or even longer. Indeed since pressure isn't much of an issue, you could do large vacuum flasks for even better insulation, though this might be cost prohibitive over simply building conventionally insulated but bigger tanks. Insulation would not be costly on a place like the moon though, where a vacuum comes with a location, and is a great way to manage the problem with solar power on the moon, where the sun rises for two weeks and then sets for two weeks. 
It's an excellent approach, and we often show an animation of such a system on the Moon in all Moon-based episodes. Also another good example of tandem use is with Nuclear, which often contemplates using molten salts in this capacity, called a stable salt reactor, though most people tend to take more interest in using the salt as part of the fuel and coolant rather than as a giant reservoir. Solar thermal works very well on any airless world, and also in the vacuum of space. We often contemplate using it for power satellites in orbit of Earth instead of photovoltaics for this reason. It's a bit easier there too because you don't need heliostats, you can just use a big parabolic dish that stays stationary to the sun, which removes a lot of the complex components and therefore reduces the cost. Also the lack of air prevents birds flying through the solar flux and being incinerated. Concentrating light on active support towers still results in some problems like that though, which are hard to avoid with the intent of efficient commercial power generation. These issues are one reason passive solar or more tuned down options are popular too. Passive solar of course is where you make your roofs or curtains reflective to bounce light away, cooling your house or very absorptive to heat it. This of course is nothing new, but if your rooftop was covered in mirrors or heliostats pointing at your own personal power tower and you had your own molten salt reservoir and generator, that probably keeps things low intensity enough to avoid obliterating local boards without losing all your efficiency. One nice thing about molten salt and steam generators is they are definitely easy tech, so it's plausible that they could be something installed at a neighborhood or even personal home level. Outside of cases like that, we tend to assume home-based solar is strictly either photovoltaic or passive. Do not assume it's limited to solar heating though, solar cooling, or cooling things with heat sources of any kind, such as with the Einstein fridge, is no more complicated than the typical electric air conditioner. In our contemplations of the Fermi Paradox or Cyclical Civilizations, folks often wonder how a civilization could get technological if their world did not have fossil fuels, either having never developed or getting used up, and these alternative solar options are good examples of parallel approaches without electricity specifically or without fossil fuels, and there's some fairly fascinating options for civilizations who develop fiber optic cables for light transmission too. That's another topic for some other time. But a key notion is that we always want to be careful of comparing old techs with newer ones, as the old tech has often had millions of folks working for decades to improve its functionality in myriad ways. We are pretty amazing with what we can do with internal combustion engines compared to back in the 19th century for instance. Solar is a great example of that and amusingly the science that would have made it viable sprung up just after we got very into using oil and coal. If the order on that had been different, semiconductors being discovered in the late 1800s for instance, we might have gone solar sooner and be way better off than we are now. Solar has a bad reputation in a lot of circles, and I think a lot of it is holdover of prior times, much as with fears of nuclear energy. Back in 2008 when companies like Solyndra failed, the technology wasn't as efficient and cost effective as it is today. For a lot of folks, getting solar power and ethanol jammed down their throats at increased cost, while being scolded for complaining about how inferior they were as power sources, did not sit well, and tends to be one of my favorite examples of horrible ways to roll out technology and policy. You catch more flies with honey than vinegar, but humans can handle vinegar just fine, they just tend to get solely if you tell them they should feel lucky about it. It can be hard to grasp just how quickly solar and wind have developed thanks to the massive, seemingly wasted investment in it at the turn of the 2010s. Humans aren't great with rapid change sometimes and the idea of solar going from unaffordable to competitive in just 5 years, and competitive to the cheapest source in another 5, is foreign to many of us. Continued improvement will help to speed that up, and of course more widespread use will help with cost and innovation too, much as with computers, cars, and all sorts of household tools and appliances. Economies of scale are a beautiful thing. It is easier to be confident about solar gaining ground nowadays, but there is a reason it had a lot of enthusiasm going for it, even back when solar panels were barely able to run a cheap little calculator. Realistically, the big appeal to solar is that there's hundreds of watts of power hitting every square meter of this planet, which amounts to about a liter of gasoline per square meter per day, in terms of instant energy, depending on your location and time of year. 
that means even at 10% efficiency, a hectare of solar panels would be producing as much energy per day as you get from burning 10,000 liters of fuel, or 1,000 gallons per acre per day. Forever, or for billions of years anyway, and our newest solar panels are running at over 25% efficiency now. Now that's not free, you've got to make those panels, maintain them, replace them, clean them, and build and maintain the wires running to them and so on. However, I want you to imagine you had some solar panels on your garage, say just 5 square meters of them, 54 square feet, or 9 by 6 foot, and some tanks on the side that hummed and gurgled away and managed that 25% conversion of sunlight into gasoline getting you 12.5 liters of fuel a day or 23 gallons of gas a week. How much do you think most folks would pay for that? Even at half that efficiency, you would need twice as many panels but they would still fit on most garages with room to spare. Now batteries might do better, or hydrogen fuel cells, or even molten salt, emphasis on the word might, but it is a reminder that none of these power techniques needs to be exclusive. As we noted in our Power Satellites episode, even with working fusion plants, you would probably still either beam energy down to Earth as microwaves, be it from fusion in those plants or fusion from sun collected as solar, simply because generating power groundside produces more heat on Earth per watt of electricity than beaming it down as microwaves would. Even in space, fusion might be more effort than equal amounts of power collection by solar would, at least until you hit the asteroid belt. Folks tend to forget it takes tons of actual solar matter at temperatures of millions of Kelvin to produce a single watt of power. That's how rare fusion events are in stars like our Sun. It seems like the containment system for something like that would be big and maintenance heavy compared to, say, a thin sheet of reflective material for bouncing light and thin sheets of solar panels or solar thermal power tower apparatus. It's very hard to say how the future of solar will go, we will use and abuse all sorts of panels and batteries and technologies in the next few decades, and see what improvements and innovations rise up from that. Fundamentally though, as far as I can tell, solar power's future is as bright as the sun that fuels it. There's an awful lot more to solar power that we didn't get to cover today, and I would recommend checking out Catalyst's episode on super solar sales and battery powered homes over on CuriosityStream for some more insights on how solar might be arriving in our homes in the next decade or so. One thing I didn't cover today and I wished I had in hindsight is the various types of solar panels, like monocrystalline, polycrystalline, thin films, and perk or passivated emitter and rear cell panels. These each have their current pros and cons, and how those pros and cons might shift with some potential advances may alter the field and market in years to come, so I've decided to make it a subject of another of our extended editions over on Nebula. If you didn't know, Nebula is our streaming service full of awesome content from creators focused on informative but fun content. It's designed to give creators more freedom than other platforms, and all of our episodes of this show appear early and ad-free on Nebula, and many have extended editions too like today's, as well as some Nebula exclusives like our Coexistence with Aliens series. And thanks to all of our Nebula subscribers since it lets me do extended editions, which are nice ways to do addendums on videos I usually write a few months before they air and often have additional thoughts on during final production. Now you can subscribe to Nebula all by itself, but we've also partnered up with CuriosityStream, the home of thousands of great educational videos like Catalyst, to offer Nebula for free as a bonus if you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in our episode description. That lets you see the amazing content on CuriosityStream and Nebula for less than $15 a year, just use the link in the episode's description. Incidentally we had a live stream Q&A this weekend and afterwards we posted a poll of topics the audience came up with during that, and there is still time to vote for your favorite of those topics, and as usual the winner will get made into an episode, just head over to the channel's community tab and vote. Also all those live streams are available afterwards, indeed most folks catch them after, but I gather many folks are not aware they just basically turn into an episode after the stream ends. Alright, next week we will take a couple episodes to contemplate Kessler Syndrome, the risk of a cascade of orbital debris around Earth, and the implications it might have on the Fermi Paradox, as well as other scenarios, natural or artificial, which might imprison a civilization on their homeworld. 
One other case folks often mention for that are worlds where gravity is too high to let them send rockets into space, super Earths. and so the week after that we will examine those and how life might evolve on them and how we might colonize them, then we'll finish out February with a look at building water worlds and marine space habitats, and our next livestream Q&A on Sunday, February 27. Now if you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell, and if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and share it with others, and leave a comment below. You can also join the conversation on any of our social media forums, find our audio-only versions of the show, or donate to support future episodes, and all those options and more are listed in the links in the episode description. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great week.